Evening, everyone. My name's Anthony Dixon. I'm just going to share some thoughts with you. I've, I've, I, I, I pondered and considered what to share, and I really feel that just sharing the journey that myself has been on, but that also, of course, incorporates pretty much my family, even though they have their own intimate moments with this whole process, as you can all relate to. And life is obviously an individual process. And I think more than anything over the past three years, that's been magnified to my soul more than, more than anything, that life is an individual process. And the journey to Christ is exactly that. It is a journey to Christ. And I thought about that. I said, what does a journey to Christ therefore look like? And I reflect back on scriptures that I read, the Bible, the Book of Mormon, Abraham, Moses, Nephi, Enos, Moroni, then more modern times, Joseph Smith. You know, what, what were these journeys? And I reflect on my life and the journey that I've been on and although I say the last three years, because this is when we got exposed to some additional knowledge and information that we were kind of confronted with, let's say, my journey's been my whole life, of course. So my spiritual journey in this mortal realm started through the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. My mum and dad were converted to that religion through missionaries knocking on the door that were never supposed to knock on that door, but met people in the street in the local town and were given a dodgy address, but they didn't know it was a dodgy address. So they knock on the door and my mum and dad are there and it's obviously not the people that they'd met on the street. And my mum and dad were not interested. Nice people. I believe my mum's a lovely person and my dad is no longer here, but a lovely person and my mum is right here at the front. But they weren't interested, but over time and time they, they, they embraced that. And, I'm, and I grew up forever grateful for the knowledge that was passed from those missionaries to my mum and dad and then I was taught it. And I reflect as I'm older and even before this time of learning additional information that there isn't a point that I could tell you that pinpoints me back to when I knew that Jesus Christ is who he says he is. Or when Joseph Smith declares what he believed and that I believed that. Or when I thought the Book of Mormon contained the word of God. I can't tell you a moment. It's been something that's always been in me. So I have never doubted the truth of those matters. It's, it's been a part of my soul forever in this, in this life. And so my whole life has been lived based upon the truthfulness of those elements. And I've put an awful lot of trust in the Book of Mormon, but mostly in my brother Jesus Christ. That, that's who I've lent on my whole life. And I've had experiences that without any doubt I know have touched my soul from a space that's not normal and I know that that's my father my mother and my brother Jesus Christ so that was kind of the remit that I lived by and we I was very committed member of the church we got fully involved um, it was the best vehicle is how I would refer to it even when I was completely there all many years ago, it was the best vehicle that I felt Christ was being delivered through. However, when I read scripture, I could see very clearly that the vehicle I was in did not deliver what Christ delivers or what Christ did deliver when he walked the earth and what he would share through other messengers through scripture. It was very clear to me. And I'd make some ad hoc comments to my wife and to others that I thought were quite out there, but as I realise now, they're not even slightly out there. Um, but 
that was how I always felt. And so for me, I would say to people, this is the road I'm going to be on all my life. If it's, if it's a mess and it's a joke, then I'm okay with that because this is where Christ is for me. And that's, that's how I lived. And then about three years ago, my wife got reconnected with a friend that she had known in, in this, on her mission, as you know, Jonathan. And she had a lot of respect for this chap and knew his closeness to Christ and his relationship with Christ. Um, and when they got reconnected, she found out that he was no longer active in the church. Um, and that intrigued her because of what she thought of Jonathan and what she had felt of his spirit. So that curiosity got her to ask a few questions and to then have a bit of dialogue. And I wasn't involved in that process at all. And then Liz would come and share a few things with me. And my instant reaction to her was, just be really careful there. Just be really careful. And then I would say to her, and she'd, she'd sort of keep feeding me a bit, and I'd say, it's all a bit verbose. It's just, it's just a lot of stuff. Just give me the meaty stuff. Give me something that's different. Give me something that adds to whatever I already know about Christ. That, 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 just give me something. But you know as well as I do, the material's not that clean and easy to just do that, right? So she would just go, uh, so I didn't really pay lo loads of attention, but I would listen. And then one day when she sort of shared, or somehow I got to find out that there was someone that was claiming that they had had visitations from Christ. Now suddenly, based upon what I've just shared with you about who I was and who I am, that has to get my attention. So I wouldn't care where that would come from or who would claim such a thing, but it's the name of Jesus Christ. Now I know there could be lots of people that can do that in the world, so yeah, I would happily go there if someone would introduce that. But because this came from an intimate person that I'm married to, from someone that she then trusts, this would cause curiosity, more than curiosity for me. Because if there's something about Jesus Christ that needs to be heard, then I would engage in it. So I started to engage in that process and to read and to look and to see how it, how it felt. Did it feel like Jesus Christ to me? Did it sound like Jesus Christ to me? Um, and I couldn't see it not. So it was confrontational to many of the things that I had traditionally believed and was very much engaged in. However, over here, it was Christ. So which one's going to win out? And for me, I've already made my lifetime commitment of what I would do, and that would be to follow Jesus Christ. I always thought that would be in this vehicle over here. And that's what I would always defend, because that's where Jesus Christ was. And now I'm being presented with a conundrum and a bit of confrontation that I'm seeing Christ somewhere else. But does that really matter? Because for me, that was always what trumps everything. And so that was the road that I started to explore down. And I can remember, distinctly remember moments when I would sit and I would really just kind of ponder. Um, mostly in wildlife and countryside. And I felt things that I hadn't felt before connected with Christ. And I would ponder the conundrums and ponder the contradictions and ponder whether this is acceptable or this isn't acceptable and how can that be and how could that not be. But I always would just be drawn back to the knowledge, the faith, the trust that I put in this man that I really believed has walked this earth and shown us how to be forgiven of our sins, how to change, and how to become like him. And suddenly I was being presented with information that was present. There wasn't someone 200 years ago. It was someone showing a different example, a way to approach Christ, a way to understand Christ more, uh, a way to get closer to him. Um, and as I referenced quite a few times when I talk to people about this, 
They said the four minute mile was unbreakable. And then someone did it. And then we know what happens after that. Oftentimes we need examples. And I don't blame a lot of people that find it really tough to entertain thoughts and different angles that are against tradition. Because we don't have people to look up to, to show us or point us. And even if we have that, it's really tough. But I was grateful for that, that access to knowledge and access to people that could share that this isn't something that is in the future. This is something that's present for you now, Anthony, if you choose. Because as I said before, drawing back, I always knew there would be things that Christ wouldn't accept. But my answer was, Christ will deal with that when he returns. That was always my thought process. And I was fine with that, and I believed I'd get on board. But now it's being presented in my face now. Confronting me now in this moment in my life. And am I going to be able to move into that space? Am I waiting for that event? Or am I going to see that there's something here is presenting that as an option now? And that was confrontational. That is challenging. And that is difficult. But focusing on my brother. It makes it the route that I needed to travel. So Liz and I, we embraced it and it, we, we fortunately had, or unfortunately, whichever way one would look at our life, had a physical journey at the same time as our spiritual journey that on the surface probably looks far more dramatic and far more challenging than the one that was going on internally. But I think they were sent from God as a gift for us to be able to travel this at the same period. And through that, we were able to see miracles and blessings from our brother, not only spiritually, but physically. And I've learned from that process that I don't think your faith, and this is just my view, I'm not sure your faith can be developed unless you're prepared to move to a space that is uncomfortable and uncontrollable and unknown. I think it's awfully challenging to expect faith to grow when you know where the next week's going to come and the next corner's going to bring and you've got it all sussed out. And for us, we were thrown that. That's nothing to do with us choosing that. Although you could say my choice has created it. Fair enough, I take responsibility. But the result of that was pushing us to a space that we were in that place. And we got fortunate to see the hand of God work in our life time and time again and it's based on faith. But as it talks about in the Book of Mormon, blessed are those that are compelled, which is me. And even more blessed are those that are not. But I see that as a true, true thing. And that through that process, we develop that faith and develop that faith. And I'm still a man of faith. I'm not a man of knowledge. I have not witnessed things that are knowledgeable. But I have a strong faith. And I've had intimate moments that have built upon that faith and developed the ability to do what we're doing presently because I believe it to be Christ. And I say to people also, look, when people talk to me about this and say, well, Anthony, what's happening with you? Or they feel that you're going wayward or away from Christ. And I totally understand that. I say to him, look, one day I'm going to sit with my brother. I'm going to stand with my brother. I'm going to talk with my brother. And if he says to me, I sent you that message. And you didn't go that way. How am I going to feel? And then I ask myself the question that I followed what I believe is the spirit and my relationship with Christ. And it's a mess. And this whole route is a mess. Which one am I happy with? I can't stand there with him and say, oh, thanks, but I discarded it. But if I go that route and he says, what were you going on, mate? I'll say, I thought that was you, brother. I obviously am so deluded to give me another go. 
but I thought that was you. I don't feel bad about that. And that's the journey I choose to go on. And so that's really where I'm at. I don't know the end of this journey, but I know where we're at. And I see in the Book of Mormon who I am now. I used to be the man pointing the finger. I'm now the man having the finger pointed at me. And it's humbling and it's meek, or I have to be meek and I have to embrace the possibility that is out there for me that I used to think I was already way down that road. Ultimately, I'm so grateful that I have a brother in Jesus Christ that has already done all this stuff, that has created the peace, the joy that I am able to step into if I choose, that I can be forgiven and am forgiven of the things that I've done and do and, and I give all credence to him and that, and that is where I seek. And I'm so, I'm grateful for the messages that are being presented. I'm grateful for messengers that have been sent by our Father and our Mother in Heaven since the world began. And these messengers are great, but it isn't about the messenger. It's purely about the message they bring. And if we embrace that message, then miraculous things will happen in our life. But it's us, it's a journey and it's an effort. And it's a graft. Again, I compare it to people spend hours, hours becoming professional whatevers. Hours consumed by it in their mind or their physicality. And they think they're going to become like Christ from five, ten minutes a day. Who am I kidding? It's a graft. It's a battering ram. And it's a journey. But it's a joyful one alongside that. If we grasp Jesus Christ. If we grasp anything else, it will fail us. It will fail us. But Christ will not fail us, and it will be our journey. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. So uh, that, was, that was my dad. And uh, my... Uh, my experience was uh, very intertwined with his, because obviously he is my dad. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, well, before I, I grew up in the Mormon Church, my up until a couple of years ago, I was born in it. I uh, never questioned. That's not true. I uh, I didn't really think that there were any other options, but um, I. I, I like to use the metaphor of a stale piece of bread. I never looked forward to going to church on a Sunday other than being able to play with my friends after primary because uh, I didn't feel like I was learning anything. I didn't feel like, as, as nice as it was to feel like I was around that kind of stuff, I didn't feel like I was getting what, the fullest to what I could out of it. But um, I, I also like to use the metaphor that when, when this stuff was introduced to me, it just felt perfect. It felt like I'd just been handed a, a, a sugared cake on a platter compared to the stale bread that I'd currently been looking forward to each Sunday. Um, not really looking forward to, but you know, just having to, having to deal with. And so, uh, and so it, just, it just felt right. And I, well, it, it wasn't really, a, it wasn't really a, a battle. It just felt good. Like if, Again, if you had to choose between a stale piece of bread and a piece of cake, like, so uh, you know, it just it just felt it felt really good, and I, I wasn't straight into it. I didn't just think, all right, this blindly walking into something that I didn't know. I thought, you know, why not? Why not? If if it's another option, why not? Um, why not look into it? So I uh, I looked into it, and I got given a couple of books, and podcasts, and different tools by my parents, and uh. It started, things just started to make sense. And um, the questions that I had throughout my whole time in the Mormon church, they were getting answered. And that's, that's, that's the reason why I, why I began to believe it, because the questions that could, were previously unanswerable and which a very, um, something that, a quote that stuck in my head, which I've told a lot of people is, that I remember one very, very you know, significant day when I walked up to my primary teacher and I said, uh, I said, you know, asked a question, something like, you know, what, what's, 
what, how did God start? You know, what's this? What? And, and, and they said, you know, well, you'll find out when you die. You can ask him yourself. And uh, I had some conversations the other day. And essentially that is saying, you know, you'll find out when it's too late. You know, you'll find out when you're... It's like finding out the answer to the test after the test. When you're given the answer, it's just, there's no point knowing it anymore. So now that I got these answers to the questions, everything just felt right and everything just felt good. So, but it didn't, I didn't necessarily feel the answer to the questions in the words. So, I mean, I'm only 13, almost 14. I'm only in year nine. I'm still in school. I do not have a clue what some of these words are that these people in the movement use, especially Denver. He must have, he's, you know, it's ridiculous. 60% go right over my head. And um, so when I was listening to the podcasts, I, I didn't really necessarily understand what he was saying, but sometimes you don't always need to understand. You can, Denver and, and, and the talks and the books, don't even know who wrote the books, you know, just don't need to. You just feel that they are of good intentions. Uh, do you, I felt them talking to me through my feelings and not through the words that were being used. And somehow I could understand what the point was and what they were talking about without understanding 60% of the words. And so and I, I felt God talking to me through that. And ever since I, I began that journey, I have felt so much more attuned and spiritually um, close. I have many experiences through um, through, especially during traveling, where I learned that maybe it's not waiting for blessings, but looking for them. So, you know, I've, I've also felt my blessings and my experiences increase. Um, and, but now, instead of looking for something significant, like seeing an angel, I see God in my life just day to day. If, you know, if the homework is optional, or if I've had a good day, or if, you know, I've been able to help somebody, you know, it's just, it's, it's just been brilliant. And I, I can f see God in my life just, just by looking for him. And especially during traveling, we've, we gained so many blessings. And um, I didn't really have anything prepared at all, but the, um, I was asked to share why this is important for me. And I think the reason is because it's uh, it feels right, and it's uh, given me truth that I would never have previously known, and it's um, connecting me to people and to God through ways that I would have never thought of, and um, I might be waffling on a bit, but um, it's just it just felt so perfect, and it felt like what I'd been looking for, and. I don't think I've ever shared this with anyone other than my mum and dad. But when I was younger, I thought, I, I thought to myself, uh, I just remember getting a feeling, like, you know, a spiritual feeling. And then a thought in my head that said, you know, you know, well, one day, you know, there's, there's something more than what you've, you know, there's something, uh, you're, you're going to be a part of something that's quite big. And for my whole life, I thought that was going to be something like, oh, yes, I'm going to get a big house. You know, I'm going to get a nice car. I'm going to be one of those. But now it just went. But when I, first, when I got introduced to this and when I f understood what that was, another voice came into my head and, and I just realised that that was it. That's what, that's, what the sp that's what the voice was talking to me about. I'm going to be a part of something so, so great that, and such, a, such an amazing opportunity in my life that it's just unpassable. Like, just, it'd be such a waste to, to ignore it. And I've said that before. I've thought, you know... People have asked me, why, why, why at such a young age have you decided to go into this? And I thought, well, I've been given this and I felt that how brilliant it is. I thought, I've, I still have my whole life ahead of me, so I have a massive head start. So it'd be such a, a wasted opportunity, such a waste of a chance to, to give it up. And so I, I followed it and so far it has not let me down and I felt God in my life consistently. So that's all I wanted to share, and thank you. And I say, do I say that? I say these things in a disgusting way. I think I'm going to struggle to talk after listening to that, mate, to be honest. Thank you, like, legitimately, thank you. And you as well, his dad. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, first of all, I guess I just want to start by saying a real heartfelt thank you um, to everybody that's here um, and to everybody that kind of made this happen. This started off, just, uh, started off as an idea, that's all. Everybody else took the idea, they added their own ingredients, they added their own influence and it became something much bigger than the original idea was. Um, so thank you. And just to express how humbled I am to be a part of whatever you want to call this, to be a part of you guys, I guess, to be a part of a community of people. Um, I didn't want to speak tonight and I never would have volunteered. Um, I haven't got anything to say. I haven't got anything to teach. Maybe a story to tell. We've all got one of those, I guess. Um, I started going through these thoughts thinking, well, friggin' hell, Denver's gonna be there. What if I start saying something about what I've learned in scripture and he's sat there going, no, young man, you've got that wrong. You've misinterpreted that. What if I'm bearing testimony with something he's going, no, what if he thinks I'm an idiot? What if other people thinking, I wanted to prepare something. I wanted to prepare something to silence that voice. I wanted that fear to stop. So I thought, go and do something. And every time I went, this is a cliched story, I get it. But every time I went to do something, something else would happen. It would be an opportunity to serve. I had a young man that I worked with with a mental health difficulty a few years back. I haven't heard from him for years. I literally sat down with my pen. He rang me. Told me some harrowing stuff. And my first thought was, friggin' hell, mate, leave me alone. I've got a talk to write. <coughs> And then I thought, the opposite, like, be about his work. Um, and so again, I haven't planned or prepared anything, but just thought I'd share a few words of my story. Um, and my story starts in the LDS church. My spiritual story starts before that. Um, when I was eight years old, I was diagnosed with a rare form of leukemia that was um, an adult cancer. Very few children got it and very few children survived it the chances of my survival were one in six. And I went to the hospital ward that day, terrified, like something out of a horror film. There was little bald children running around that looked so malnourished and pale. I was absolutely gobsmacked. What am I doing here? And that fear was so real that nobody could take that away. But I had a, a blessing from a chap that came from church and he put his hands on my head and he gave me the blessing. And he said, you're not going to die, but you need to go through this for something that's going to happen to you in later life. I instantly thought I'm going to win the WBC <laughs> World Super Featherweight Championship and I'm going to be rich, but I'm going to be so humble that I'll give those riches away to the church and I'll be like one of the Osmonds and I won't need to go on a mission because I'll just stand there with all my world championship belts and preach the church. That's what this guy was talking about. Um, the doctor pulls this guy aside and basically said to him, what the hell are you telling that young man? He's not gonna, not that he's not gonna survive, but you don't have the authority to say that. And I haven't shared this story with anybody outside of my family, really. Um, there was a time when I went into intensive care and I knew that there was a fervor about the people about me, my family, and I could sense that they were afraid of me passing. And I was very well aware. I had, one of the first things I said to, the, to the, the, the doctor is, you know, be up front with me. There's a chance I'm going to die, right? And he said, yeah. So I said, OK, I know what we're dealing with. And I went into this room and I remember it vividly, crystal clear. There was various beeps and machines and whatnot. And I had an experience that was just, I'm trying to find a word for it, I don't think there is, but just peace. Just peace, not as the world gives peace, just peace. And I hadn't eaten for three months. I was fed uh, intravenously with a tube and I started eating again. And the next day, I started eating again more and I asked for more food and started to put weight on and they, they scanned me and the doctors came back and said, the blood counts add up, it's gone. Um, so all I needed to do now was train, go and win that world title, finish this story, we were on track. Um, and then I went on the internet one day, and my opinion of the internet is that it's essentially, it's, 
had a very similar effect to Mormonism as the printing press for Catholicism. Um, and I ve very innocently went on this new internet thing that we had at home. You had to plug it in and you had to come off the telephone and all the rest of it and just to make that weird noise and stuff. Um, to try and research for this talk that I had to give and I just typed in the word Mormon or Mormonism or something like that and was bombarded with stuff that I'd never seen and wasn't expecting to see. They were telling me things about Joseph Smith that hurt to hear that I didn't understand. They were telling me things about polygamy. They were telling me things about the age of his brides. They were telling me things about his motives. And I was shocked. I'd put my entire life on this organization. Things at home weren't always great when I was young. And I used to see, quite simply, if certain people in my home simply lived the rules of the church, my family would be together. Therefore, the church is true. And so I wanted to live the church to the best of my ability as to not be like certain people in my family home. Um, and so uh, this stuff concerns me. I take it to the bishop. He told me to leave it alone. I take it to the state president. He told me to leave it alone. And this hurt me. I kind of took this personally because I thought that there would be these men that I looked up to and revered and respected. I thought that they would welcome me in and say, come in, sit down with the smeddy, let's talk. And lots of them didn't know the things that I was talking to them about or just told me to silence myself and, you know, don't worry about that. I couldn't not worry about that because these experiences that I had when I was young, they taught me that the church was true, right? That's, that was my only context that I had. If there was a God, he was a Mormon. Um, if there was truth, that was Mormon too. If there was a book of Mormon, that belonged to the Mormon church. I belonged to the Mormon church. And I desperately wanted it to be true because it worked, at least in my eyes, in my upbringing. So I arrive at a place after studying all this stuff and going from door to door, president to president, trying to find answers into prayer. And people used to go, oh, you just need to pray about it. And I used to think that's such a cop out. Just give me an answer, please. Answer my question. Stop sending me back to the Lord, would you? Um, that's just because you don't have an answer. You, just, you don't want to answer my question. So I decided to read the book. Read the Book of Mormon. And before this, I'd read the Book of Mormon. We had seminary, we had an institute, we had all those things. But I think, looking back now, I had a very Disney-esque, if that's the word, a Disney-esque idea of the Book of Mormon, of who Nephi was, of what he looked like, like Hercules from the Disney, from the Disney movies, um, that the message was... This guy had a bow, he broke his bow, but he was faithful, get another bow, so I need to be faithful if my bow breaks. And there was no real kind of depth. But I knew there was truth. I knew I'd had these experiences, and now I've got this book. And so I'm married at this point. Um, we were married in the temple. I decided to read the Book of Mormon and to see what this book's trying to teach me, separate and independent from the church, or from what anybody had taught me. Um, long story short, my mind was blown. I went to my bishop, who was, I think some of you met him last night in my home, and he said, look, bring all the anti-Mormon stuff in that you've been reading. I'll quash all of it. I know all of it. I've been through it, Leroy. Bring it in. We'll talk about it. I said, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. We went in the next week, my wife and I, with one book. We went in with the Book of Mormon and he said, what's this? I said, you know what this is? <laughs> you just might not know what it says. <laughs> um, we're friends so we can have banter. Um, and we went into the Book of Mormon and I said, Charles, I'm convinced that we're the Gentiles. I'm convinced that we are the Gentiles. No, we're not the Gentiles. When we get baptised, our blood changes, blah, 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 blah. And I said, I'm convinced that, you know, we are the Gentiles in the Book of Mormon and the things it says about us aren't very um, flattering. And so I wanted to play a brief clip um, of your mate. So yeah, I came across this clip. A friend sent me this, um, trying to teach me that the Book of Mormon had a message. So um, let me, tell me if you can hear this. Oh, don't worry. It was, it, was, it was queued up. Don't worry about it, Chris. Chris, don't worry about it. It was queued up to a right time. And if it's not there, don't worry about it. It's fine. But essentially, I was sent this clip. Um, 
And in it, Gary E. Stevenson from the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles looks to the congregation and he says, do you know that you've got, this is me acting in now, do you know that you've got the advantage of having this entire record in your hands? Do you know that ancient prophets saw you? Do you know that he saw your day? And then he goes into scripture. Behold, I speak about you as if I am present, although I am not, but the Lord got to show me unto you. I'm paraphrasing. And he says, and I know of your doing. And he has an emotional quiver in his voice. He says, I know of your doing. To bolster up these people, I've checked with one of my American friends that you guys have the uh, blowing smoke up my ass. He's a, 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 yeah. Blowing smoke up the ass of the congregation. You guys are so amazing that he saw you, all of you guys. And I sent it back to my friend and said, he didn't tell you the next line of that scripture. <laughs> which, <laughs> which I'm about to, but I'm sure you know it. <laughs> yes. Um, I've only gone and lost that as well. Okay. <laughs> behold, I speak unto you as if you were present, but ye are not. But behold, Jesus Christ has shown you unto me, and I know your doing. He leaves it there. And I know that you do walk in the pride of your hearts, that there is none save it be a few who do not lift themselves up into the pride of their hearts, unto the wearing of very fine apparel unto the envy and strifes and malice and persecutions and all manner of iniquities and your churches, yea, even every one have become polluted because of the pride of your hearts. For behold, ye do love your money and your substance and your fine apparel and the adorning of your churches more than you love the poor and the needy and the sick and the afflicted. O ye pollutants, O ye hypocrites, ye teachers, who sell yourselves for that which will canker, why have you polluted the holy church of God? Why are you ashamed to take upon yourself the name of Christ? I'm not going to try and call the guy out, but this is someone that stands up and calls himself an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ and then takes his words and bastardizes them to teach the people out there that they're great. Whilst the exact scripture that this guy is quoting is saying, you walk in the pride of your hearts. No, not us. How can we walk in the pride of our hearts? We're the one true church. Don't be so silly. Come and join us. We'll tell you all about how good we are. It broke my heart. This flipping message broke my heart because my idea of my self-worth and overcoming my childhood trauma and the sins of my fathers was the flipping LDS church. They promised me that I'd be a good person if I did what they said, that I'd, I'd, I'd make it to the celestial kingdom. And I arrived at a point where I had absolutely nothing, two children to teach. Um, didn't know what was true. I had a business partner that was a very faithful Muslim, lent me a copy of the Quran. I was impressed by certain bits, confused by other bits. Everything just led to more confusion, more fear. Until realizing what I'd known all along, that Joseph Smith's already trod this path and shown me exactly what to do. So I get down onto bended knees and I'm trying to talk to the Lord. And I said, I'm trying to become as a little child in as much that I know nothing and I've got nothing to offer you other than my heart, which is so broken because my brain's so messed up, I haven't got a flipping clue. But if you can work with this, then I'm prepared to work with you. Um, and then I read a book, The Second Comforter. There's a few coincidences that led me to that book and people that I'd met online and everything. And I became friends with a chap called Tim Malone, who some of you may know, who was um, at Denver's 10th talk. And I was up at about two or three o'clock in the morning pressing refresh on my computer to see the new information that's coming through. And he talks about how baptism or rebaptism had been mentioned. I've been reading in the scriptures about the principle of rebaptism, it was jumping out on me, these things. I realized that my own baptism occurred when I was eight years old. And it occurred because I was eight years old and for no other reason. And when I was seven and a half, I knew it was going to happen when I was eight. And I did it because my parents told me that that was the thing to do. Reading the scriptures later on in life, I realized that my baptism didn't follow the order, the, the, the order set by the Lord. There was no faith, really. There was no repentance. 
I realized that I'd been baptized into a particular franchise of Christianity, of the one I was born into, well, not even of my choosing necessarily, um, and wanted to be rebaptized. There was, again, a, I'll keep it brief, a number of coincidences later, and we, we had the mayors come over and be able to baptize myself, and I was able to baptize my wife and then baptize both of my children. Um, and going back before this, there was something that stuck out all, all, all the way throughout Mormonism. There was something, when I was, I was young, um, I can't remember how old, and one of the brethren at church, I forget his, his calling, asked me to learn um, a quote by Joseph Smith. Um, and I'll paraphrase it, the standard of truth has been erected, no one hallowed hand can stop the work moving forward. I think you probably know it. Um, boldly, nobly and independent. I never understood the word independent and it bugged me even back then. I thought, that's weird. I'll just shelf it. I'm not going to investigate. I've got an Xbox, whatever, when I'm that age, but that's weird. And I never understood because I was always taught that the Book of Mormon and the Mormon church were so entwined that one does not exist without the other. Boldly, nobly and independent. So Joseph's using, in, that, in the way he's, he's, he's talking to us, he's using what would be in public speaking or literature, the rule of three, right? This idea of using three things to build an argument. So you think of, say, like a triangle, three strong sides in geometry or, say, architecture. So you'd use these three things to produce an argument. So you'd say maybe like boldly, nobly, majestically, boldly, nobly, courageously, or something that builds that argument. Boldly, nobly, and independent didn't seem to fit. It was incongruent with the other two. It didn't seem to, it didn't seem to fit. And I remember that coming back to me and really hitting me. That now you understand what I mean when the Book of Mormon will go forward boldly, nobly, and independent. Independent of the Mormon church and the multi-billion dollar corporation it's become. I've since then come to know exactly what that book is. And the title of this guy's talk was Look to the Book. So I'm going to steal his title. He can sue me if he wants. I'm going to steal his title. Yeah, Look to the Book. Don't look to Gary E. Stevenson. Don't look to me. Don't look to Denver Snuffer. Look to the book. The book has got a message that's brutal at first. That we are the Gentiles. That we are associated with the Gentiles, as Joseph said. Um, but when Joseph said that that book will bring us closer to Christ than any other book and is the most correct book on the earth, I understand now what he was talking about. So I just want to add my voice as a witness to the Book of Mormon that is going forward boldly, nobly and independent. Independent of the Mormon church. Independent in the same way that every single person in this room is independent and an individual. It will go forward in my heart. It will go forward in, in our hearts as a group of people. We would use that book to correct the walk in our daily lives. And that that book will bring us close to Jesus Christ that that book will bring us back into his presence if we do the things that we're asked to do. I've since learned that the gospel in the, G in, in, the, in, the, in the Book of Mormon is not the gospel espoused by the Mormon church. It's faith, repentance, baptism. Seek the baptism of fire for the, Holy Ghost, for the gift of the Holy Ghost. And then we will be told all things that we need to do. And I often thought that this idea of awakening was like some super spiritual thing that was, you know, really nice to go through. And I, I look back at the, one of the, the scene in The Matrix, if anyone's seen that movie, um, where he wakes up and he's pulling things out of him and he's in this, and it's, a, it's a mess. Um, this process, the Lord has allowed me to see what a mess I am and what a mess I was, still am. I'm not saying was as if in past tense, I'm saying maybe a little bit more of a less of a mess than back then. And I, met, I touched on this briefly um, that my experience with the Lord, I didn't know the Lord, I knew a caricature of the Lord that the LDS Church taught me. Um, and I'll share my kind of interpretation of my relationship with Him as for some, some of you heard this, this yesterday. So, um, He's a sparring partner for me. Meaning that I say to the Lord, I want to be like you. I want to be a champion like you. 
I'm going to do what you've done. And he says, are you sure about that, mate? Are you sure? Uh -huh, I'm sure. So he throws me a pair of gloves and a gum shield and says, come on then, step in. And then proceeds to punch, beat me up. Or a boxing coach that sits on the safe side of the ropes, having been a boxer, to teach this person how to go into battle. How to be like him. We all want to be like Jesus Christ, yet we say, give me no pain. I don't want to bleed. I don't want to suffer. I don't want to sweat. I don't want to lose friends. I don't want to lose face. I don't want to lose money. But I want to be just like you. Um, I'll wrap it up, but I just want to add my testimony that if we will subscribe to Christ, then he will tell us the things that we need to do and we will be more like him um, and less like ourselves. I know that's a good thing for me. Um, and that we can be in the presence of Jesus Christ. I say these things in his name. Amen. Amen. Amazing. Well, thank you, first of all, for inviting us. Do you know how hard it is to follow those three acts? <laughs> wow. I knew this was going to be a little bit hard, but that, that's uh, Leroy and the other two wonderful testators of Jesus Christ uh, just took it to a new level. So thank you for inviting us. We are thrilled to be here. I'm speaking for my husband who's here on the front row, Dave. Um, my husband and I hail from Salem, Utah, so the western part of the U.S., and together we have 13 children. I brought seven children to our union, and he brought six. We are grateful for all the extra blessings that have come with that and are especially grateful that we are on this journey together. What a great and humbling adventure it has been because we, like all of you, know that pursuing to truth comes at a very high cost, now more so than ever. In fact, it takes a boatload of courage to not only seek the truth, but to honor it by doing something with it. And that always requires sacrifice in some form. So I honor the courage that brought each of you here tonight. Julian Assange captured this idea when asked uh, what his greatest disappointment was in life, to which he replied, learning that even intelligent people can be cowards and that courage is a much rarer attribute than intelligence. Tonight we'll, we will speak of things that may require courage to hear and perhaps even more courage to share with others as you feel impressed to do. But I have the sense that you are up for it, so let's dig in. Three things cannot be long hidden. The sun, the moon, and the truth. One of my favorite truisms for sure, courtesy of Buddha, but especially as it underscores uh, the central message I'm going to share tonight with you. And that message is how the ineffable power of uh, our divine parents to create life, to sustain it, and to, then to leave their fingerprints all over it has been maliciously twisted by the evil one into a lie that is the foundation of the most su successful satanic propaganda of deceit and murder in the history of our existence. Now, it is always apropos to put the three of them together in the same sentence, meaning father being the radiant sun, mother the reflective moon, and the fact that together they embody the truth of all things. But tonight it is especially so as we glory in the truth about the awesome power of creation and realize that the time has come to pull that truth out of the dark abyss of deceit, insert it back into the ongoing dialogues of our respective cultures, and then defend it against all enemy forces, and they are legion. To do this, we're going to start with the end point and work back to the beginning. Well, what does that mean? I'm going to spend the next 10 to 15 minutes discussing my book called Ripened, Why the Book of Mormon Damns America for Abortion, and how I came to conceive this central premise, which is that any nation or people who embrace and engage in the abhorrent act of abortion will be damned to suffer divine destruction according to the Word of God as it is recorded in the Book of Mormon. Then, after discussing how it all ends, every single time, we will walk through the process of how a nation arrives at that perilous place where divine retribution is the only course left for God to take. So let's get started with how it always ends. When speaking about my book, I like to start with the dedication, because in a few words, it sums up the why, the why for me, the big why, and for everything that comes after that page, and I'll get emotional, and I do every time. This book is dedicated to all of God's precious and holy ones, whom he so fearfully and wonderfully made but were gone before they could be seen and silenced before they could be heard. He sees you. He hears you still and always. God never stops hearing the cries of his children, born or unborn. That is not just a warm, fuzzy platitude. It is an actual fact. And I stand here, or sit, <laughs> here and now as a witness 
that the Book of Mormon provides the most definitive and conclusive proof of that fact, period. Which is why in the introduction I make the bold claim, which I will read in part, that goes like this. The Book of Mormon is the only book of ancient scripture on earth today that boldly and directly exposes abortion for the insidious evil it is. Though veiled references can be teased down in the Bible, only within the pages of the Book of Mormon will you find definitive declarations from God himself about how he views the crime of abortion and the cataclysmic destruction that ensues when he unleashes his wrath upon all those who are complicit in the crime. Now, I'm guessing nobody's really new here to the Book of Mormon. No? Okay. All right. Well, that's okay. I, I, want, I always try to register this caveat anyway. And it is this. Though the Book of Mormon is almost exclusively associated with the Mormon Church, the Book of Mormon does not belong to the Mormon Church. As I go on to state in the introduction, it is a sacred record of an ancient people given as a gift by God to all of his children, Jew and Gentile alike. And as I go on to state in the introduction, um, or, and, and there's more, but the bottom line with that is just what, uh, it's like um, what Leroy was saying. Um, it's not their book. It's God's book. And therefore, it is crucial to understand that the Book of Mormon does not belong to the Mormons any more than the Bible belongs to the Catholics. So back to the book. How did I formulate or conceive the premise that the Book of Mormon calls out abortion and condemns it in the harshest terms possible? Well, briefly, in, here's my story. In January of 2020, I was preparing some lectures about the Book of Mormon. I'd been invited to speak at five or six countries in Europe, uh, in, well, Institutes of Religion, LDS, Institutes of Religion in Europe. And though I'd read the Book of Mormon several times and studied it for years, I had decided to study it more earnestly than I ever had. A few weeks prior to this night, I had stumbled onto something President Ezra Taft Benson had said in 1986, and it drove me back into the book with a renewed desire to go deeper than I ever had. Here's what he said. The moment, the moment, the moment you begin a serious study of the Book of Mormon, you will find greater power to resist temptation. You will find power to avoid deception. You will find the power to stay on the straight and narrow path. When you begin to hunger and thirst after those words, you will find life in greater and greater abundance. And then two years he, later, he added this. Every Latter-day Saint, and I would extend it to every sincere truth seeker, should make the study of this book a lifetime re, uh, pursuit. Otherwise, he is placing his soul in jeopardy and neglecting that which could give spiritual and intellectual unity to his whole life. Now, that's a lot to take in at once, I know. But suffice it to say, these words planted a seed in my heart that grew into a deep desire to have that power to resist temptation, to avoid deception, and to find life, or resist temptation, avoid deception, and to find life in greater and greater abundance. I desperately needed each of those blessings. At that time, I was a single mother of seven children, trying mightily to make my way in the world and to train my children up in the ways they should go. And therefore, I did not want to place my soul or theirs in jeopardy by neglecting the spiritual and intellectual unity gained through a study of that Book of Mormon. Honestly, could anything be any more critical in this darkening world than attaining spiritual and intellectual unity? Having one without the other is simply not enough to avoid deception. Not anymore. We need both. Remember Assange's disappointment that there are plenty of intelligent people in the world who are cowards, but courage? Yeah, courage is rare. That is, when, that is what comes when you couple the, the spiritual strength that comes through the earnest study of the Word of God, which is the courage to stand up and boldly call out the deceptions of Satan without apology or fear. So that was the driving force behind my intense study that began in 2020 and continues to today. For me, the process that instill involves asking questions, lots and lots of them, about everything in the book. So on that night, back in 2020, I was reading in Helaman and noticed something about the word iniquity. It had appeared frequently throughout the Nephite narrative alongside pride and their various other sins. However, despite all of their sins and their multiple wars with the Lamanites, the Nephites had managed to avoid destruction for nearly 500 years of their existence to that point. But that all changed when a man called Gadianton comes along. In my reading, it was clear that there, there was something he did that put the Nephites on a fast track to being ripened in iniquity unto destruction in just under 85 years. What on earth did he introduce to them? Well, whatever it was, I reasoned it had to be bad because shortly after his appearance in Helaman II, Mormon makes this bold statement. 
And behold, in the end of this book, you shall see that this Gadianton, this one man, did prove the overthrow, yea, almost the entire destruction of the people of Nephi. Hmm. So the question that quickly formed was, how can one man be so malevolent as to cause the downfall of an entire nation? What evil did he introduce to the people of Nephi that precipitated their demise in the most violent show of destruction imaginable? Hmm. Well, I just kept digging and noticed a phrase a few chapters later that only appears in Helaman and is directly connected to Gadianton, and that phrase is secret murder. This is the phrase I was ta I'm talking about. Oh, let's see. Got to go the other way. Uh, oh, there one. So Helaman 6.17. I'm not going to read it all for time, but... Uh, talking about the Nephites, they had been blessed and they were getting gain, and, and then they began to seek to get gain, that they may be lifted up one um, above an, one another. Therefore, they began to commit secret murders, secret murders, and to rob and to plunder that they might get gain. Um, what, what is the secret murder business that, Mor that Mormon was talking about? And why add this, the word secret to murder in the first place? I sat on that question for a minute, not able to shake it off, and I really can't explain why it had such a hold on me. Perhaps it was just because it was awkwardly a little bit redundant. Because murder is pretty much always done in secret, is it not? Isn't that the point? Nobody wants to get caught for murder and face the consequences, especially in Zarahemla, where murder was a capital offense. So I went back through the previous chapters and noted that before the Book of Helaman, the, mur the word murder had been mentioned dozens of times, but never with the word secret in front of it. What did Gadianton become, oh, excuse me, when did murder, or why did murder, become secret murder magically once Gadianton came along? Is it because four chief judges were murdered in the book of Helaman? Highly unlikely, because we all know that God doesn't destroy a whole nation for four political assassinations. And nobody would survive if that's the case. So after pondering a little longer, I started to wonder if secret murder referred to killings being done secretly on a mass scale. But where is that in the book? I didn't remember reading anything that suggested the Nephites were engaged in something so iniquitous and such, on such a large scale, uh, large scale. And if they were, how could they keep it secret? After a few more minutes and no real leads, I closed my scriptures and crawled into, under the covers and tried to fall asleep. But I still couldn't shake those questions. I needed an answer. So I just kept, kept asking out loud, Lord, what does secret murder mean? Now, by the way, a real perk to being single, as I was mentioned, I was single at the time, was that you can have these out loud conversations with God in bed uh, and with no weird looks for a sleeping from a sleeping spouse. So it's, it's great stuff. So I'm just talking out loud, as I was wont to do, in bed, lights off, and just, OK, what, what does that mean, Lord? What does that mean? What does that mean? Mind is, mind is going. And then whoosh, out of the blue, a word flashed into my mind, totally unbidden. And that word was abortion. And I did not see it coming at all. In fact, I remember audibly gasping as it hit me, and I sat straight up in bed, and I said, no way, out loud. No way, Lord. That can't be true. And then, again, out loud, Lord, is there any chance that the Nephites were practicing abortion as a nation on a mass scale? Is that what secret murder means? I began to feel this pit in my stomach as I processed the implications in my head, and after about 10 minutes of that, a sense of calm began to settle in, and what felt completely incredulous a few minutes before, began to make a little bit more sense, and the, guy, the, the dialogue began to sound something like, well, okay, okay, I guess secret murder could mean abortion because in the most technical and literal sense of the word, abortion is, in fact, the consummate secret murder. I mean, think about it. There's no body to find, no crime scene to investigate, no missing person to report, no search and rescue team sent out. In fact, except for those directly involved in the act, nobody even knows a murder has taken place. And even the place it takes place, the womb, is a secret hidden chamber. With that understanding now, the questions kept coming even faster, like, for example, well, how could, it, how could an ancient people like the Nephites have had the knowledge to, to be able to do that? And, and did, they, did they know that then? And question after question, finally, I couldn't take the suspense any longer. I jumped out of bed and do what we all do at 3 AM. I went to Google. And I just typed right in the search, or the search, I want history of abortion. And I was shocked that dozens of sources came up documenting the fact that the knowledge of abortion is indeed very ancient. In fact, the earliest written re records of abortion go back 5,000 years to Emperor Shenong in China. But the Egyptians also wrote about it, as did Socrates and other well-known historical figures. To my utter surprise, the recipes, or what are called the abortifacients, what are the plant-based elixirs and, and formulas they can make, 
and they did make, um, you know, are very ancient. So I bought three, big, three books about the history of abortion and went back to bed totally, well, I'm going to borrow your word, gobsmacked. We don't say that a lot in the U.S., so I love that word. Anyway, that's right. I used it right, right? Surprised? Shocked? Okay. All right. Good. All right. We're good. The next day, I found one of the most compelling pieces of evidence for ancient abortion, which was from Dr. Hugh Nibley. He'd written a series of articles in the Enzyme in 1979 that discussed the Book of Enoch and how important it was. He made a reference to the fallen angels and how they taught men to sin. Upon doing a search in the book of Enoch, I found in chapter 69 a list of fallen angels along with each of their roles in teaching sin to humanity after the flood. When I came to the fallen angel named Kazdea, my jaw dropped. Look what I found. Here's Kazdea. This angel taught humans wicked smitings of flagellations of evil, including how to smite an embryo in the womb to kill it. And then there, you know, abortion. Right there, right, right in, the, in the book of Enoch. And I thought... Ha! Huh, what? Needless to say, my sleuthing adventure really commenced in, in earnest on that cold January morning in 2020, culminating, culminating three and a half years later when I published this book, ripened two months ago on September 8th. As you'll see in the book, I walk through the pieces of evidence in pretty much the order I received them. But to be clear, though the initial piece came in, a, in this blinding but very unexpected insight, the rest of the pieces came slowly over the next several years as I kept reading, knocking, and asking. And I was glad for that, as I saw, many of those during the, I saw many of those blessings and promises that President Benson listed come to fruition in my life during this time of intense study of the Book of Mormon. All I can say is I am not the same person I was when it all began nearly four years ago. Now, I don't want to say too much more about the book because I know that your scripture sleuthing experience will be more meaningful than my explanation of the evidence. However, I want to add uh, one more piece of this puzzle, along with two spoiler alerts. Soon after realizing that secret murder was an encrypted code phrase in the Book of Mormon, that the Book of Mormon writers used to call out abortion, my next question was, did Jesus himself address this with the Nephites? And the answer to that question becomes painfully clear in 3 Nephi 9, when he calls out 16 wicked cities in nine consecutive verses and explaining that they were all destroyed for the same reason. And that was, quote, that the blood of the saints should not come up unto me any more against them. And he repeats that verbatim five times in those verses. I have them all here, and I'm, of course, not going to read them all, but this is the first 11 verses in 3 Nephi 9. <clears throat> and then to make sure that, um, and I, I, did, I, I put them in red, but um, I'll just read this bottom one, for example. Um, that the blood of the prophets, this is verse 8, that the blood of the prophets and the saints should not come up any more unto me against them. But you can see everywhere in red is just repeating those same words verbatim, nearly verbatim. One time, it's, one time it goes from um, come up to cry up is the only difference. And then to make sure there was no question about the, how the blood of the saints was shed and by whom, he turns his attention to the wicked uh, city of Jacobugoth and calls them out for many things, including secret murder. And that is found in verse 9. So he lays out all the things, calls them the most wicked city on earth, and then says um, that the blood of the prophets and the saints should not come up anymore against them. But if you back up that, he says, because of their secret murders. So now we have this nexus where we've linked secret murders, the shedding of the blood of the saints, and the reason they're destroyed. With that, piece in, pl with that pl in place, suddenly two things became abundantly clear. The murder of innocents had been happening on a mass scale since Gaddy Anton introduced the practice of, of secret murder, and here's the key, as it is deeply and darkly connected to secret combinations. I don't have time to go into that. That's what I'm letting you, I'm saving you to, to, to um, be able to read about in the book. But um, that's really kind of the undergirding thing that was the big aha moment for me, and, and like I said, I'll let you get to that. But the second was that the cries of their blood had become so loud that the God of heaven came to avenge that blood with a show of hellfire and destruction that we can scarcely fathom. So who are these saints? Whose blood cries up to God? I explore that question at length in the book and use a variety of scriptures that make a compelling case that a large portion of those saints are babies. I'm not suggesting the term saints only refers to babies. What I do suggest is that based on scriptural evidence, babies certainly fit the de definition of a saint, like this one, for example, in DNC 74.6. But little children are holy, being sanctified through the, the atonement of Jesus Christ. And this is what the scriptures mean. And then I add a lot 
several more, a handful more scriptures, like from King Benjamin and several others throughout, including Webster's definition, 1828 Webster's uh, dictionary uh, definition of saints that was um, contemporaneous with Joseph's time. And so there's a lot of evidence there too. I just want to give you a piece of that. But anyway, so that led me to the first spoiler alert. Let me check my time here. Hold on. Okay, good. Doing okay. That led me to what is the first spoiler alert, and that is that there is a sinister connection between secret common and nations and abortion as secret murder. Um, oh, I already said that. Oh my gosh. Okay, so here we are. Um, oh, here it is. The second, there it is. Um, the second spoiler alert is that modern day Gentiles are in for a world of hurt, not unlike what the Nephites experienced, the Nephites experienced in 35, 4 AD. And it's not if, it's when. What do I mean by that? In my book, I discuss four key prophecies, two from Nephi and two from Moroni that bookend the Book of Mormon. Nephi in the opening act is shown both the destruction of his people later in 34 AD, so now five, in 550, whatever BC, he's shown that first destruction in 34 AD of who would be his people, but then he's also shown the destruction of the modern day Gentiles, which I'm so glad Leroy made such a case for the fact that we're the Gentiles and we are on the chopping block for all kinds of reasons, including the ones he talked about, and, and this, is, this is even more. So it's not a matter of if, it's when. And um, then, let's see. Uh, okay, so in the opening act, he, he's the two, and the destruction of modern-day Gentiles. And then he states, Nephi, in no uncertain terms, that the cause of the destruction in both cases, both in 34 AD and with the modern-day Gentiles, is the same in both cases. And guess what that case is? Guess what is the same? Well, let me show you really quick, and I won't read them all. But this is the first prophecy about his people in 34 AD. And in the end, it says, or in the last, uh, right there at the bottom um, verse, it says, he's explaining what will happen to them. And they cast out the prophets and the saints, and they slay them. Wherefore, the cry of the blood of the saints shall ascend up to God from the ground against them. And then his next prophecy in 2 Nephi 28, 10 through 11, dealing with the Latter-day Gentiles, he, again, indicts the Gentiles for all the reasons and all the things that Leroy was talking about and more, but um, that the blood of the saints shall cry from the ground against them. So hopefully you, you notice that the, 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 the verbiage is the same in both cases. Well, it gets even deeper when you realize that Moroni, at the end of the book, states that, the, um, states that um, in Ether 8, first which, by the way, I believe is the most insightful chapter in the Book of Mormon when, you, when it comes to understanding who runs the world today and how and why. It's all in Ether 8. But um, this is what he says in Ether 8 about the Latter-day Gentiles. And he says, um, again, at the bottom, he goes through all the, the list of horrible, deplorable things that the Gentiles are guilty of. But at the bottom, because of the blood of them who have been slain, for they cry from the dust for vengeance upon it and also upon those who built it up. So he, and then in the first verse at the top, he says, the Lord will not suffer that the blood of his saints, which will be shed by them, shall always cry unto him from the ground. Now, here we are in the last days. Can you think of any other group of people that we're rounding up and just slaying and, that, and they qualify as saints? Like, I don't know what's happening over here in the UK, but over in America, we're not just rounding people up and slaying them, except we are in one situation. We are with babies, right? And so that's, uh, that's another key. And so, and then Moro, uh, Mormon also uh, indicts, again, the Latter-day Gentiles in the scripture that Leroy was talking about, about seeing our day. Behold, I speak unto you as if you're present, yet you're not. Anyway, it goes down, and in the uh, verse 41, Behold, the sword of vengeance hangeth over you, and the time soon cometh that he hath avenged the blood of the saints, for he will not suffer their cries any longer. Who are these, who are these saints that are dying right now? Who are they? In America, I don't know of any other than a lot of babies. Um, so just, just so we know, um, oh, and so anyway, yeah, the likeness there is that the same, whether Nephi is talking about it or Moroni is talking about it, it's the same, the same reason. There's, the, the Gentiles are, are guilty of shedding the blood of the saints. Now, I don't know what the numbers were in 34 AD, but in the U.S., the numbers of secret murders have been upwards of 65 million since 1973. <laughs> Here in the UK, the numbers are between 10 and 15 million since the Abortion Act of 1967. The bottom line, according to Moroni, is a sword of vengeance is coming down on the Gentiles for many reasons. But the predominant reason is and was for the shedding of the blood of the saints, and he will avenge their blood just as he did in 34 AD. It is not an empty threat. 
He set a powerful and damning precedent that we ignore at our own peril. Okay, now I'd like to switch gears a, look, a little bit and look at, the, look at all of this from a different angle to get a more complete picture of how this applies to our day and what we as followers of Jesus Christ can do about it. But before we jump into that, I want to let you know that I have a more comprehensive pre uh, presentation on this um, on YouTube. So you can just look that up if you want any more background content. And I have a, a website, ripenedamerica.com. It has my blogs and whatever. So if, if you want more of the evidence, that's where it'll be. Okay, so now that we know how it ends for those who slay their sons and daughters, as it said in 3rd Nephi 1, um, I'm sorry, in 3rd Nephi 9 1, let's discuss how such an insidious evil takes root. As Gandhi pointed out, truth, like the sun and the moon, cannot stay long hidden. It will eventually come out and vanquish the gross falsehoods that ooze from every corner of this dark world. But some of those gross falsehoods are so ex expertly dis disguised that 80 to 90% of all people will fall for them every time. And the biggest claims, the biggest of these lies has to do with claims and counterclaims. C.S. Lewis cut straight to the heart of this matter with this truth. There is no neutral ground in the universe. Every square inch, every split second is claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan. That, my friends, is what allows the, the most prolific liar in the universe to tell the biggest lie ever concocted. And what is that lie? That all of creation, from every strand of DNA within us, oh, back up here, that every strand of DNA within us to the spiraling galaxies above us does not belong to God. Huh, it doesn't belong to God. The Father is the creator and therefore the one and only claim holder and true owner, and claim holder and true owner. Astonishingly, he, has been a li he who has been a liar from the beginning has managed to convince most of humanity that none of that is God's at all. By rolling out the most cunning and diabolical propaganda ever produced to counter the claims of God as to what, what is his, which is everything, Satan has deceived most of the world about almost everything, but most tragically about life and who can rightfully claim it. A moment ago, I mentioned compelling proof of his handiwork regarding the miracle of conception and birth and would like to share with you a handful of proofs that are packed with symbolism. These are just two, three of my favorites. If we have time, let's see. Okay. Hmm. All right, well, I won't, uh, let's see, I won't show it. Well, let's see. I had three of my favorites. Um, this one was a video. Let's see, let me go through it. Um, this is a video of what happens in conception. You've probably seen it. It's been going around the internet. And let me just let me just try to get to it here. Um, is it not? Let's see. I guess it's not even on here. So maybe I. Okay. Well. Anyway, um, it's and what happens is as you as you remember seeing the video. So it comes in and um, it, you're seeing this darkness and all of a sudden this light comes in and it looks like a ball and it, then there's just like this explosion and science kind of explains it like there's a chemical reaction with zinc and whatever, and, and then light is released, and of course they try to make it about that. But actually that's not true, um, or actually the gal who was actually a, a preacher was saying that um, really what's happening is light is entering in. And I just, um, I go on to make the point that in Genesis um, 1, let's see, let's go there then, let's see, nope, back one. Genesis 1, 3, 4, then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. Um, and so the point is, is that when God's light enters in, and I have this thing about light, but when it enters in and touches a creation, it puts his fingerprints all over it and marks his claim and marks that that is his and, um, and leaves no doubt that matter, no matter how distorted things on earth get, um, that his fingerprints are everywhere, and if we see them, we know whose it is, and we can keep that claim his and not listen to the counterclaims of Satan. And those counterclaims show up like, in, for example, in this way, um, they convince women, they've con managed to convince mothers from all over the world for many years that it's their body and their choice. But that couldn't be any more wrong. It is God's creation. And the question becomes, and so therefore it was never her body, um, that was created at conception and therefore never her choice to make. How long do we allow this biggest of all lies to leave our lands drenched in his blood, which is crying out to you as we speak? So 
I just invite you to stand with me and like C.S. Lewis emphatically declare that the world was, uh, that there is no neutral ground. Every second, every inch, and every heartbeat is claimed by God, which means irrefutably that every second, every inch, and every heartbeat is his creation and his glory. And that as such, we are being lied to, just like C.S. Lewis has uh, claimed, that it is our choice to do what we want with his creation. It is not. It is his. And so um, I wanted to um, show that and then talk about how, and we're out of time, but I um, had a couple more slides that are cool showing some of those other patterns in conception. The tree of life, um, like with Nephi, with some of our DNA in the spiraling, and then this piece right here. I'll leave with this and then... Um, and leave my testimony, but um, I don't know if anybody recognizes what this is or, or what this picture is about, but this is actually a human placenta. When, once after birth, it's laid flat. Surely, as you can see, it looks like the tree of life. And then I link that back to Nephi's uh, vision, Nephi's dream, when he's given the interpretation of what the tree of life is, and he's shown the condescension of God to conceive Jesus Christ um, with, mother, with his mother Mary in the flesh. And so... Um, there's so many beautiful symbolisms and ways to see his fingerprints everywhere and to know that that process is his and his alone and it is not ours. And that after the day that we stand up to say, it's mothers, we, it's, in our, it's in our power to stand up and say, no, no more, never again. We were wired to protect our young and it will never happen on our watch. And the minute that happens, all the, po the politicians and their laws and their inducements and their tax paying funds to try to get women in that door they cannot put them on that table if women and mothers, or mothers everywhere, will just say no. And to the fathers, I would say, and the men, you were wired to protect. You get in, you sign up for wars, and you get flown all over the world to, to fight battles for other people's children and all those young and helpless, defenseless people. And it's brilliant and it's and it's valorous. But perhaps our biggest battle is right in front of us in our own communities, in our own families, in our in own in our own circles. So to the men, do not be bullied into that lie, oh, I can't say anything because it's not my body, it's her body, it's her choice. That is a lie. We are all in this together to protect his life, his creation, his truth. So I wanted to say that. And then end at now with um, what, okay, got one more minute here. Um, with an experience I had, which became, interestingly, the prologue of my book. And then I will end, so give me one more minute. Um, it became the prologue of my book, which is ironic because it didn't come until my book was already written. I, in fact, it was just a few days away from publication. I was out on a bike ride like I do every day as my therapy for the hour and a half. I have a route that I do. I go disconnect from my phone in the world and I just go and I talk. And I, It's like Leroy said with his sparring partner, I just always know that he's just pedaling right next, next to me on a bike, Jesus. And so we have great conversations. And this one day, right at the end, I'm, and I'm ready to, to send this book off to be published. Uh, the conversation was sounding something like, you know, I've really um, done the best I could despite my weaknesses, and I hope that, um, I hope that, this is, that this is okay, that this work is acceptable. And all that I can describe and how it came back to me, and not in an audible voice per se, but the sense was a gentle nod, and then, it is important to me. Why do you think that after, immediately after, um, after breaking the bands of death in Israel, my first order of business was to go halfway around the world and avenge those cries, and avenge their cries and uh, their blood. And it stopped me short. I stopped, I had to wheel my bike over to the side of the road with tears coursing down my face. I had never considered the disparity between the destruction in Jerusalem, which was to say none, and what was happening in America at that same time, where all but a few were absolutely decimated in the most violent divine act that we probably could even, can't even fathom. So why the difference? And so, needless to say, I didn't finish my, walk, my bike ride. I ran straight home, ran in the house, helmet, shoes still on, sat on the bed, grabbed it, read my scriptures, read through the Gospels, and saw that, yes, three of the Gospel writers mentioned um, darkness for three hours while Jesus was on the cross. One of them, Matthew, met, represented a, a quaking, a little bit of a quaking after, but then they went on with their lives, and they prepared for the Passover, and they just prepared 
for the Sabbath as if nothing had happened, as if they had not just brutally killed the creator of all. And yet, in his first order of business, he did not avenge his own innocent blood that had just been shed at the hands of brutal murderers. He shows up halfway across the world to burn the place down because he could hear their cries and was waiting to get there. When I realized that, I knew that I needed to raise my voice with this and say it matters to him to the tune of 65 million deaths and all the other ones, not just those, because in Gethsemane, when he paid the price for not just our sins, but our pain and our suffering, he would know exquisitely something about those 65 million and he could hear their cries. So stand with me that we can get this out and just know that the answers for our day are in the Book of Mormon, just like this one. It is for our day. I leave you with this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So, uh, first of all, I, I just wanted to commend everything that's been said here tonight. Uh, what a remarkable group of speakers, group of ideas, and group of people. And I am thankful the Lord brought us together here. None of you are on video. I am, but nobody can see you, so it's okay to raise your hands. I have a few questions, and I, I, I would sincerely like to know, because I want to know who I'm talking to. You have to forgive me. I spent most of my career in the church being the gospel doctrine teacher, which means I'm going to be asking a lot of questions, <laughs> and feel free to answer them. But I'm going to ask a few questions first. Um, by show of hands, I'm curious, how many of you are former Latter-day Saints? And I don't... that. Official or unofficial, but you consider yourself former. Okay. How many of you are current Latter-day Saints and you'd put yourself in that camp? Okay. And any, any that you would call yourself in between somewhere? <laughs> perhaps you're questioning. Perhaps you're wondering. Perhaps you're trying to sort all this out. And how many of you are spies sent here from Salt Lake City? Good. Okay. All right. Now we know. Now we have a little bit of an idea on the room. Um, well, great. Tonight, I want to talk about, no matter, no matter what, what bent you come from, um, okay, and I got to get in my head when 30 minutes is up. Got it. Okay. I want to talk about a couple of questions that perhaps as current or former or questioning Latter-day Saints ought to interest us. I'm going to start with a scripture I'm going to read, and I don't know yet if I'm going to sit or stand. The scriptures are down here, but I like standing up so I can pace, and we'll just see what happens. Quick quiz question. When was the Book of Mormon published? 1830. Uh, when was the translating finished? And it went to the printer. 1829. And when was the church that, after a couple of name changes, became the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. When was that church organized? Also 1830. April 6th, right? Okay. Was the Book of Mormon published before or after a church existed? Before. Okay, that's interesting. Um, but then shortly after the Book of Mormon is published, a church comes into existence, and within a little over two years, you all can probably quote this, the Lord says, and your minds in times, in times past have been darkened because of unbelief, and because you have treated lightly the things that you have received, which vanity and unbelief have brought the whole church under condemnation. And this condemnation rests upon the children of Zion, even all, how many exceptions were made there? None. Okay. Even all, and they shall remain under this condemnation until they repent and remember the new covenant, even the Book of Mormon and the former commandments which I have given them, not only to say, but to do according to that which I have written, that they may bring forth fruit, meet for their father's kingdom. We've all heard that before, hopefully. And this notion that there's a condemnation that the Lord talks about resulting from darkened minds due to unbelief. So to lay a few ground rules, what is unbelief? Let's get a working definition. Be brave. Somebody tell us what's unbelief. 
untrue religious beliefs. So it's not that you don't believe anything, it's that you believe something that's false, that has no saving power, that has no virtue. And so he says, the Lord says that all these people who have awakened, who have arisen, who have come on board, who have joined this new upstart church, and who have gained a testimony that there's a prophet on the earth, and that there is a book of scripture come from God, your minds are darkened. You're filled with unbelief. You've brought the whole church under condemnation. Why? Because you've taken lightly what? The Book of Mormon. So they have to repent and remember the New Covenant, even the Book of Mormon, and the former commandments, not only to say, but to do. There's a lot we could unpack there. The thing I want to unpack is, what the heck were the unbeliefs about the Book of Mormon? Did they have an unbelief that says the Book of Mormon is true? Is that an unbelief? No. I mean, probably all said, no, the Book of Mormon's true. This is the Word of God. In fact, this is proof that we have a prophet. This is proof that Joseph Smith was called of God. So what unbeliefs do we have about the Book of Mormon? In my lifetime, the president of the LDS Church, sustained as a prophet, seer, and revelator, said that unbelief hasn't been lifted. What unbeliefs, perhaps, did we suffer under, or do we suffer under, in LDS Mormonism regarding the Book of Mormon? Go ahead. Didn't take, don't take the council seriously. What it talks about, doesn't it say something like that? They're condemned for not taking the things of the Book of Mormon seriously? Yes. Good. So not taking it seriously enough. And the follow-up question, you don't have to answer this, we will. The follow-up question, how do we take it seriously? But Leroy had something to say. Unbeliefs about the Book of Mormon. It'll come back. It'll come back. Okay, so I remembered. Um, they believed the book was written about others. Believe the book was written about other peoples. Yeah. You know, about, about those Gentiles. Yeah. You know, all the Gentiles that do not read the book, never read the book, reject the book, will never hear the warning. Those Gentiles, but not us. We are Israel. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Yeah, that's a huge one, and I'm glad you brought that up earlier. You nailed it. You're absolutely right. Other unbeliefs. What about, I think the biggest unbelief is to give it lip service. Here's what I mean by that. Leroy, what did Nephi look like? <laughs> We've all seen him. We've all seen the illustrated children's stories, right? Laman and Lemuel dress like what? They, they, they dress like these uh, you know, wealthy sultans that have many camels and tents. And Nephi dresses like a freaking caveman, right? He's got the thing over the arm, and he's just huge and buff, and, he's, and, and we all have this idea that, and why? Because somebody wrote children's stories about the most significant thing that's happened since the atonement of Jesus Christ, about the book that God sent into the world to end it. And we turned it into children's stories, and we turned it into sound bites. I've seen you and I know you're doing. See, the Lord has his eye on you because you're special and chosen. Thank you, Brother Stevenson. Do you have any idea how offensive that is? To take the scriptures and rest them in that way. Do you have any idea what it took to get the Book of Mormon into our hands? I want to just trace that trajectory for a moment, if I may. I'm going to start with another sound bite from primary, okay? You all know this one. You can say it with me as soon as I start. We'll all quote it together. I will go and do the things which the Lord hath commanded, for I know that the Lord giveth no commandments unto the children of men, save he shall prepare a way for them that they may accomplish the thing which he hath commanded them. First Nephi 3.7. You guys rock you will pass your primary graduation and there will be cake. <laughs> but what's the deal with that? What does that soundbite teach you as a children's story? Obey the brethren. Hey, hey, I will go and do the things which I've been commanded. And what have I been commanded? Pay your tithing, go to church, follow, the follow these rules, follow the prophet. 
And if you do all that and check these certain boxes, then you're going to go to the celestial kingdom. <laughs> That's what we learn from Nephi. Let me tell you what was going on. Records were kept from Adam's day. Why? Why was it so necessary that we have records called scripture? So that everyone knew there was a God. Yeah. So that everyone knew there was a God, because the first thing you have to have to exercise faith, according to Joseph Smith, is that the idea that there is a God. Second, a correct idea of his character, perfections, and attributes. You're going to get that from Scripture, too, if you study. And then third, you need to have an actual knowledge that the course you're pursuing is in accordance with God's will. You have to have Scripture. Because from the foundation of the world, the only way that we become acquainted with the notion that there is a God is that God makes himself known and that that gets written down and testified to by those who have experience with God, beginning with Adam. And so a book of remembrance was kept, and the children were taught. That's how they learned to read and write. And you have scripture, and that's passed down and passed down through a holy order of record keepers that are careful, that care for the record, that provide what needs to be provided so that we can have understanding, ultimately to save us. We're all stuck down here in the bottom of this well, and there is a rescue plan. And if that is withheld, and if you never find out what the rescue plan is, then you're stuck in the bottom of the well for who knows how long. But there is a rescue plan. It's recorded in Scripture. Unfortunately, at a certain point, those Scriptures were destroyed, most likely by the jealous brothers of Joseph, who also destroyed most of what we call the coat of many colors, the garment the garment that was given to Adam in the garden and passed down. <coughs> Scriptures were gone. The next time we have a record, it's called the brass plates. And the brass plates is what Nephi was going back to get when we have the soundbite about following the brethren. <laughs> and the reason Lehi and his family escaped, fled for their lives, three days journey into the desert, and then Lehi is commanded by God, send your sons back and get the record. The record was the replacement for what came down from Adam that had been destroyed. It's written on metal. Can you alter what's written on metal? No. No, you can not very easily alter it. Is it easy to destroy? It would take extraordinary effort. It's more resilient, more prone to protection than the previous set, and it's locked in a treasury under the guard of a man who has command of 50 because it's that important. In fact, the, the plates of brass are called by the Lord in the Book of Mormon, what? The record of the Jews. The record of the Jews, not a record of the Jews. By this time in history, the Deuteronomists had been very carefully, methodically, and horrifically mangling the scriptures to remove all mention of the Messiah. Jews the world over believe in and expect a Messiah to come. Where do they get this belief? Well, from the Old Testament, right? That's their scripture, right? You know that idea appears nowhere? The word Messiah appears exactly zero times. It's all gone. It's all been gutted except on the brass plates, where we have Zenoch, and we have Zenos, and we have Nahum, and we have all of the prophets who testified of these things. The Book of Mormon tells us Moses testified of the Redeemer to come. But that record only exists at this point after Josiah's reforms. It only exists on the plates of brass. And the temple treasury is about to get sacked. The Babylonians are on their way, and the record is that they sacked the place and carried away anything precious. The brass plates would have been gone forever. Scripture would have been gone forever, and the rescue plan just got incinerated. Except you send in Nephi, who I don't have to retrace the story for you because come hell or high water, no matter what it's going to take, he's going to find a way to do what has to be done to save the world and to save you personally. You have a Book of Mormon because of Nephi. Now, that is everything that's, no, that's not everything. That's a portion of what's packed up in his statement. And there's a great deal more. But then for a thousand years, the Lord sent prophet, historian, record keepers, and carefully controlled 
what was in the scriptures. Every time there's something having to do with scripture, you'll find there's a statement that says, it is wisdom in God that these things should be done. It is wisdom in God that we keep these records. Nephi says, I've been instructed to make a second set of plates, and I don't know, but it is for a wise purpose. Every time you see it is for a wise purpose or it is wisdom in God, you, you find out it is referring to the creation, the recording, the preservation, the abridgment, the translation of Scripture. Because wisdom is the one who oversees this. She gave us the curriculum for our school. And so the Book of Mormon comes forth and it gets turned into children's stories and ignored. There's one part of it that I don't want to see ignored. And so for the next few minutes, and I, I realize that in this room, there's a great deal of deep study. There's a great deal of taking very seriously this book. And I'm grateful for that, <laughs> believe me. And so I'd like to add to that and I'd like to join with you in studying something. And so I want to ask you this. Why do we have the Book of Mormon? What's it supposed to teach us? What's the main message? Summarize it. Anyone? Mission of Jesus Christ. The mission of Jesus Christ, which is? His teaching, baptism, repentance, forgiveness, and of course the atonement, and how to be saved, and how to come into him. And... All of that, exactly right, exactly right. All of that for the purpose of redeeming you and me to help us come unto Christ and to be saved. Ultimately, to be redeemed, which is to come into his presence. That's the personal level application. Now, do you think a book as significant as the Book of Mormon, with a 4,000 year pedigree of being very, very carefully curated by God, has only one personal message? Are there some group messages? There are. And I'd like to focus on one of the group messages. So I'm just going to read a few scriptures here, and let's talk about them. You all have read the Book of Mormon, I hope, right? To some degree or another, we, we all have. And there's a lot of Isaiah quoted. And you remember that Nephi quotes Isaiah quite extensively. And do you remember that you start reading the Book of Mormon, and 1 Nephi chapter 1 is the most read chapter in the entire book, and then it progressively declines until you hit 2 Nephi, and there's the old joke about the guy that gets shot, and he's got a Book of Mormon in his breast pocket, and it stops the bullet and saves his life, and he opens it up and says, yep, right there, nothing gets past 2 Nephi. <laughs> right? So there's all this Isaiah stuff in there, and Isaiah is hard. Isaiah is difficult. But Nephi included Isaiah at length. Why? What do you think? He saw our day. He saw our day, yeah. He saw our day and saw this is applicable. Any other thoughts? Any other reasons he used Nephi? To say the things he couldn't say. To say the things he couldn't say. Because as you may recall, Nephi is going along, he has this vision. He wants to see what his father saw. He sees the the ministry, the mortal life of Jesus Christ, the atonement, the resurrection. Then he sees a church formed, and then he sees scripture corrupted, and the church is great and abominable, and the world is gathered together against the apostles of the Lamb. And it goes on down to our day, and then he abruptly stops and says, oh, can't tell you anymore. Stops right when he gets here, just outside in the parking lot. But he didn't come in. He stops and he says, I can't tell you anymore because that's not my job. There's a guy named John. He's going to write about that. But he sure wishes he could. And then being a sneaky, sly kind of a prophet, he says, oh, I recognize Isaiah saw the same stuff. And Isaiah did write about it. And nowhere does it say I can't use Isaiah's words. I just can't talk about it. But I can, I can sure quote what Isaiah did. And then he goes on to bore every teenager to tears with the Isaiah stuff. So, why did he do it? That's what I'm going to talk about for the next nine minutes. <laughs> Here we go. I did read many things unto them which were written in the books of Moses. This is Nephi talking about his brothers whom he's trying to persuade. So he reads the books of Moses, which are Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, so that's stuff that the Jews would call the Torah. But 
that I might more fully persuade them to believe in the Lord their Redeemer, I did read unto them that which was written by the prophet Isaiah. Now, I just told you there is nothing in the Old Testament that even uses the word Messiah. And the Isaiah stuff about Jesus Christ is veiled upon veiled in poetry and in allegory and in symbolism. That's why Isaiah survived. Otherwise, we would have no Isaiah. It would have been taken out by the Deuteronomists. And so how does that Isaiah stuff more fully persuade them to believe in the Lord, their Redeemer? Have you read the Isaiah stuff? Did it more fully persuade you to believe in the Lord, your Redeemer? That's why he put it in there. He says so. So let me explain perhaps a couple of the reasons why. Let's see. Um, here we go. Jacob did the same sort of thing. Jacob talked about the history of the world and the future history, but he didn't quote Isaiah. Jacob quoted a lengthy allegory written by who? Zenus, Zenus. Zenus the allegory of the olive trees, right? And we talk about that a lot. And he talks about the Jews first. And in the context of talking about the Jews, he says the following, Behold, the Jews were a stiff-necked people, and they despised the words of plainness and killed the prophets and sought for things that they could not understand. Wherefore, because of their blindness, which blindness came by looking beyond the mark, they must needs fall. For God hath taken away his plainness from them and delivered unto them many things which they cannot understand because they desired it. And because they desired it, God hath done it that they may stumble. And now I, Jacob, have led on to the Spirit unto prophesying. For I perceive by the workings of the Spirit which is in me that by the stumbling of the Jews, they will reject the stone upon which they might build and have safe foundation. Did they reject the stone? Yeah, yeah who is the stone? Jesus Christ. He says, yeah, they're going to, the God of Israel will come among them and they will reject him. But then he goes on to say this, but behold, according to the scriptures, this stone shall become the great and the last and the only sure foundation upon which the Jews can build. And now, my beloved, how is it possible? How is it possible that these, after having rejected the sure foundation, can ever build upon it, that it may become the head of their corner? Behold, my beloved brethren, I will unfold this mystery unto you. If I do not by any means get shaken from my firmness in the spirit and stumble because of my over-anxiety for you. So what is he going to explain? He's going to explain how you can reject and kill your God and yet turn to him and be redeemed. How is that even possible? How can that ever happen? That's the question before us. And then he says, behold, I'm going to explain it to you. I will unfold this mystery unto you. Behold, my brethren, do you remember the words of the prophet Zenos, which he spoke, saying, Behold, thus saith the Lord, I will liken thee, O house of Israel, unto a tame olive tree, which a man took and nourished in his vineyard. And he goes into the whole allegory to explain what? To explain how you can reject and kill your God and yet find him and build on him as a safe foundation. Ultimately, that's something we call the gathering of Israel. And it's prophesied to happen now. <laughs> And it's underway, and the Lord is doing it. And one of the primary purposes of this book is to bring that about. Because God is a God of covenants, and he made a covenant promise to his friend Abraham that in the last days his posterity would have another opportunity to accept what had been rejected, to receive what had been lost to come into the covenant and be saved by the God of Israel whom they crucified. God is keeping that promise. Not because the house of Israel in its scattered and desolate state is all that good, and not because any of us are all that good, but because he made a promise to Abraham 
And he renewed it with Isaac, and he renewed it with Jacob, who became Israel. And part of that promise is that in the last days, this message will go forth, and that those who are willing will hear the words of the book, spoken as if from the dust, and they will awake and arise. Well, that's going on now. That's underway. The last thing that I'll point out about that book is this. When Jesus Christ himself came among the Nephites, and he gave the most masterful sermon we have recorded anywhere in Scripture, and it is an absolute masterpiece. It's a work of art. I dissected it once and put it on the wall. It's 10 feet long and 4 feet wide. Do you use feet here? Not really. Okay. <laughs> it's big. And it is a dual chiastic structure. I don't want to bore you with what all that means, but it is absolutely incredible. And at the end of it all, as he's summarizing the message he gave at the beginning of the sermon, and now as he's wrapping it up, he's recapitulating the message again from the beginning. And he stops and he interrupts that final summary of the message, and he quotes Isaiah. And he quotes a chapter that is all about the redemption of scattered Israel. He says, Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear. Break forth into singing and cry out loud, thou that didst not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. Using this imagery about a woman who not only is barren and without child, but has been forsaken and left by her husband and is all alone and has no hope in this world and has no support and no protection in this world. And he says, no, no, no. You will have children. Your husband didn't forsake you. You will yet be honored. You will yet be a married wife. For a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I gather thee. In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. And he goes on and talks about how Jerusalem, the, the watchman will lift up the voice and there will be singing and rejoicing and Israel will be gathered. And in the midst of all of this prophecy and poetic prose or poetic imagery, he says this. Behold, I have created the smith that bloweth the coals in the fire and that bringeth forth an instrument for his work. Behold, I have created the smith that's a mistranslation, that bloweth the coals in the fire, another mistranslation, that bringeth forth an instrument for his work. The mistranslation that got, let, got written as smith is an engraver, specifically one who engraves. The mistranslation that blows the coals, the Hebrew verb for blow is nafach, to blow on coals, specifically. The Egyptian form, and I can show you in the Egyptian dictionary, is Nephi. The correct translation. Behold, I have created the engraver Nephi that bringeth forth an instrument for his work. That day is upon us, brothers and sisters, and this book is more significant than you or I can possibly imagine because the God of Israel will use that instrument, not only to save you personally, if you will heed its message, but to keep the promises that he's made for thousands of years to redeem and gather Israel at the last day, so that there's a people ready to welcome him when he returns. You and I can be part of that people if we will take seriously that book and stop doing the crap that has been done with it in unbelief for 200 years. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Knowing that I was coming over here, I found some quotes from Englishmen to use, <laughs> assuming that a proper education... That's one of the problems with religion generally, and the truth almost invariably. 
George Bernard Shaw said, Beware of false knowledge, it's more dangerous than ignorance. Ignorance leaves you, you know, still unaware. False knowledge makes you certain, and that's where unbelief comes from. And then this other one, which I like most of all from George Bernard Shaw. All great truths begin as blasphemies which is where often we find ourselves. I had, a, um, I had a Catholic friend, still have him, shouldn't talk of him in the past tense. Um, I had a Catholic friend who heard uh, I had been excommunicated from the LDS church for writing a book. And he called me, excited about that, saying, you know that when you write a book and get excommunicated from a religion, over time that makes you a saint. <laughs> so someday you're going, as a Catholic would think, someday you're going to be canonized. <laughs> I thought, oh, settle down. You're my friend because you coach baseball. And that's what we talk about, not religion. He's an honest man, however. I went to the Rose Festival at the Catholic Church with him. Uh, he owned a motorcycle. I owned a Harley Davidson. We went on a poker ride. And this was a Catholic Church affair. On a poker ride, you ride from bar to bar to bar, and then you stop at the bar and you get a card. And after you have made five stops, you have five cards. And um, depending upon the hand, someone would have the winning hand with the best group of cards. Now, when we got to the fourth stop, which was a bar in a little town called Lehigh, Utah, full of cowboys and about 98% Mormon, the bartender was talking about how the Catholics were welcome. They ought to come back. They have a big affair every week on Wednesday evenings where the local Relief Society ladies come in for dinner at this Lehigh, Utah bar. And so if the Relief Society could go on Wednesday evenings, I felt proper as then, and a Latter-day Saint, attending the same thing. But it was going on too long and I had to leave. So I gave my four cards to my Catholic friend and I had to go home. We had some family thing going on. He kept my four cards. He went to the fifth bar. He collected two cards. And then he went back to the Catholic Church in Draper, Utah, submitted two hands of cards. And in my absence, my Catholic friend said, I had the winning hand. I won a $700 leather coat as a result of winning the Catholic poker run. <laughs> I wonder how many Mormon friends, Presbyterian friends, or others entrusted with the winning hand, and in my absence, would have surrendered a $700 leather coat because it was me that was the winner and not him. He's a trusted friend as a consequence. I know him to be honest. I've been listening to everything that got said here today, and, and I, I was struck in particular by Amberly's statement about this singular individual that, that murder went on among the Nephites, but it wasn't coupled with secret until... Gaddy Anton, and then the account that she gives of how um, things progressed from there until the utter destruction of the people because of the prevalence of 
secret murder among the Nephites. And um, I'm persuaded by her book. I think she makes a very sad but telling point. When I was a law student at Brigham Young University, it was a, it was a very young law school comparatively. Uh, I would be in the fifth graduating class. But every year, because um, the, the, the president of the university and the dean of the law school and several of the other members of the faculty had been clerks at the United States Supreme Court, every year um, during the moot court competition, we would have one or more members of the United States Supreme Court come to the law school to sit during the moot court competition by the students. And then they would meet with us afterwards. And I, I met a number of the uh, Supreme Court justices, including uh, Chief Justice Warren Berger wh while I was a law student. And I, I was a member of the ad hoc committee with Chief Justice Warren Berger that founded the American Ends of Court, modeled after the British Ends of Court. And so someday I hope in London to visit the Ends of Court there. But one of the justices who visited while I was there was Justice Harry Blackman. Justice Harry Blackman wrote the majority opinion in Roe versus Wade, which in 1973 made abortion legal in the United States. No one voted on it. No one had a say on it. It went through the courts and Justice Blackman wrote an opinion which said that through the third trimester, abortion was a constitutional protected right, not found in the language of the Constitution, but found in, and this is the language, found in the penumbra to the right to privacy. Penumbra is a word that describes that gray zone between light and dark. It's not fully lit, but you're still somewhat out of the darkness. And in that vague, poorly illuminated, if you can call it that, area between the right to privacy that we think is brightly lit in the Constitution and some things that may possibly be implied, there was this right to privacy that guaranteed a woman the ability to have an abortion. There's a scathing dissent written by Justice Rehnquist, who also would come to our law school <laughs> while I was a law student. And um, Justice Rehnquist said, there's absolutely no precedent for finding this to belong to the right to privacy. It didn't exist at the time the Constitution was written. It was illegal and considered immoral, in fact, criminal, in every one of the original 13 states that adopted the Constitution, and it is by and large illegal throughout the nation at this time. And so you have a penumbra in the majority opinion, and you have an outright declaration that what Justice Blackman had written is a load of crap. However, there is a majority opinion and a dissenting opinion written by Rehnquist. There were other opinions that joined in for other reasons, but Blackman's was the majority opinion. And it was like they were, they were speaking opposite one another in different directions with different reasoning without ever coming together to, to meet one another's arguments. So when Justice Blackman 
opened up the meeting for questions in the moot courtroom, and I was raising my hand to ask a question, and Dean Lee knew that was problematic. <laughs> uh, Dean Lee was relieved to see Blackman was calling on people throughout. I was on the far left. I guess I would have been on Justice Rehnquist's far right, which is probably a little more symbolically suitable. And after, after trying to be called on for some time, Justice Blackman said, oh, I'll take one more question. Uh, I haven't called on anyone from over there. And he called on me. And Dean Lee looked, <laughs> looked like I uh, could have gone all day without having this. So I stood up and I said, Justice Blackman, um, we have a dissenting opinion in Roe versus Wade. Okay, I just spoke the tragic words, Roe versus Wade. He'd been on campus for like two weeks and no one had invoked Roe versus Wade. And now there it is in all its messiness sitting right on the table. In the, in the dissenting opinion written by Justice Rehnquist in Roe versus Wade, you, in the majority, seem to be like two ships passing in the night. Would you please respond to Justice Rehnquist's dissenting opinion and explain why he got it wrong? Thank you very much. Elvis has left the building. <laughs> and, I, and I sat down, and there was this long, awkward pause while Justice Rehnquist, or Justice Blackman, paced back and forth up behind the bar at the front of the moot courtroom, rubbing his hair back. And after a long silence, he did not answer my question, but essentially said, well, he first told a story about how when he came to the Supreme Court, the um, sergeant at arms came in to his newly assigned chambers and dropped a large book on the table with a loud thump and said, sign it. And he looked at the book, and it was the Bible, and it had the signatures of venerable prior justices, Oliver Wendell Holmes, um, Taft. There were, there were a number of names that he listed, and he's kind of being a tourist looking at the signatures in the Bible when the sergeant at arms <coughs> <coughs> clears his throat like, Get on with it. And he signed his name, and the sergeant at arms closed the Bible and left. He said he was a religious man. He said he was a man of faith. And he said that religiously there was no way that he could justify abortion. But he said constitutionally, he did not see any way to prevent it. And therefore, what he wrote in the majority opinion, he felt had to be done. All of which got sent down the river by a decision of the Supreme Court just in the last few years, in which they overruled Roe versus Wade and they sent the decision back to the states for the states to grapple with and not as something that gets imposed from the top without the public being able to vote on the matter. This is from the Book of Mormon. Now it is not common that the voice of the people desireth anything contrary to that which is right. But it is common for the lesser part of the people to desire that which is not right. In 1973, the people did not have a vote. They were not given the opportunity to decide that. A single man acting in the role of Gaddy Anton imposed upon an entire nation of over 200 million people the judicially imposed 
from the top down edict that abortion in the United States is a right, can't be prevented. But that right got restored to the people And the United States was given the opportunity to make a decision at the state level about whether they would or they would not permit abortion to continue on. And so for the last couple of years in the United States, state legislatures have been grappling with it. Politicians have been running campaigns in which They came out supporting or opposing abortion, and state legislators have been elected as a consequence of the position that they hold. And just, I think, last week, Ohio voters were given the opportunity to decide whether they would amend the Constitution of the state of Ohio to allow abortion to take place as a constitutional right in the state of of Ohio. And the people of Ohio voted to amend the constitution of the state and to make abortion a right that they have in the state. Well, see, the the, the role of decision-making was never given to the voice of the people in 1973, but it has been given now. For as their laws and their governments were established by the voice of the people, and they who chose evil were more numerous than they who chose good, therefore they were ripening for destruction. For the laws had become corrupted, yea, and this was not all. They were a stiff-necked people insomuch that they could not be governed by the law, nor justice, save it were to their destruction. There are a handful of states that have made abortion either illegal altogether or limit it to circumstances that we find compelling, like saving the life of the mother or rape or something similar. But on both coasts of the United States, the decision has been made that abortion is permitted. So we find now the voice of the people having been persuaded, if you had had an election in 1972 in which this issue was put in the lap of the people and they were permitted to vote, there's no question what the outcome would have been. It had to be imposed by edict. The edict was issued by Harry Blackman. In a very real sense, he has occupied the role of Gaddy Anton because now, after 30 years of it being a right and arguments having been mustered to support it, people can't conceive of it being anything other than a right. And therefore, the voice of the people now has been persuaded by Gaddy Anton that it is altogether right and fitting that we should engage in the process of murdering the unborn. It's one of the sobering lessons in the Book of Mormon. But the Book of Mormon does not leave us without hope. The destruction that took place is analogous to the destruction which will take place. And the destruction was targeted. God knew who to spare, and God knew how to spare them. However random, however um, surprising the circumstances may have been in which the destruction took place, God knows who his people are. And God has a line he won't cross. He will let the wicked destroy the wicked. He will even let the wicked destroy the righteous to a point in order to justify his judgments against the wicked. But what he will not do is destroy the righteous. 
he can't do that. It would violate one of the laws that he has adopted for this entire creation. God will not destroy the righteous. Therefore, if you accept the Book of Mormon, believe its principles, follow its precepts, and accept it as it has been offered in 2017 to us as a covenant, God will not allow the elements to be used, the destructions that have been decreed, or the fires that will consume the wicked as stubble to affect you if you remain true and faithful to what he asks of us. And what he asks of us is largely that our hearts be inclined, that we do our best. You don't have to be error-free. He's a forgiving, loving God. Try to do what he asks. Give it your best effort. And realize that God will not only refuse to destroy you in the coming judgments, but he will protect those that are his sheep. I also want to make clear, because this question came up in a conversation I had about a week ago, I want to make clear, there's no reason to be in a panic about the coming judgments. First of all, not everyone who uh, has not heard of the Book of Mormon or accepted rebaptism is going to be destroyed. That's not going to happen. There will be many, many good people from all over the world with backgrounds that are as divergent as Hinduism and Islam and even atheism who live harmlessly with goodwill towards their fellow man, who do not present a threat to anyone, who have regard for their fellow man. They won't be destroyed, they'll be preserved. The reason why the prophecy into the millennium talks about people that the heathens and it being well with them and there being an effort to reach out to them during the millennium is because many of them are going to be preserved in the coming destruction and there will be a lot of opportunity for people in very far spread places to say, hey, come let us go up to the mountain of the Lord's house where we can learn of his ways. And why do they have to learn of his ways at the mountain of the Lord's house? It's because where they reside, they don't have it. They have to go and learn it, that we may walk in his paths. See, once they learn, then they want to return and they want to live their lives accordingly. There's a great effort that will be made among people, good people who will be preserved in the coming destruction. So if you've got someone in your family who's a good person, and this good person thinks you're heretical, if they're a good person, you don't have to wrestle them down into the River Thames and dunk them under the water in a panic because otherwise they're gonna ignite like a match head when the Lord appears in his glory. That's not how this is going to work. Calm down. Look, the best way for people to be interested in what you have to offer assuming you have something to offer, is to calmly go about living your life confident in the message of the Lord, in, in, trusting in the Book of Mormon, and living true to, to the faith that you hold. That arouses curiosity. And when someone asks to know about something, they're a whole lot more interested in hearing what you have to say than they are when you come in hands on hip and finger wagging saying, you're gonna be damned, <laughs> but I'm not. 
And I'm not because I got something you don't got. You, you need what I got. You're not going to persuade anyone with that kind of nonsense. If they're good people, rejoice with them. Love them. Be kindly towards them. Be patient with them. A long and patient example. When they see, I mean, why do, does the Lord in the Sermon on the Mount say, Blessed are you when men will speak all manner against you falsely for my name's sake? It's because hearts have been broken by hypocrites so often that no one trusts a genuinely religious person to be authentically what they claim to be. I can't remember the name of that preacher from Oklahoma. I want to say swagger, but I don't think that's it. There was a preacher from Oklahoma who um, had a had a university. No, no, it wasn't. It wasn't Baker, and I don't think it was Oral Roberts. Although Oral Roberts had this guy made like Newsweek magazine. It's been a while. Um, could have been. Anyway, this guy, I think, I, I want to say it started with an H, but that doesn't matter. Name doesn't matter. This guy wound up sleeping with the co-eds at his university and getting caught. And when he got caught, this is, um, this really tells you where his heart was. He's a Christian minister, but where his heart was, he said he couldn't help himself. <laughs> It was in his genes and chromosomes. It was biology. He just couldn't help himself. And there's an article about it, and he's giving his confession and saying, oh, he's compelled to do so. And my reaction to the article was, yeah, if he'd kept his genes on, his chromosomes wouldn't have been spread about the campus. <laughs> We're accustomed to that kind of crap from the religious community. I had a friend who went to present a paper to a group of Christians in Atlanta. And he presented his paper to an a auditorium full of Christians. And one of them came up to him and said, you, you talk and write like you believe this stuff. And he said, yeah, I, don't you? And the, the Reaction was pfft, nonsense. So he asked that there be a show of hands in the auditorium of those who did not believe the account of the New Testament to be accurate, trustworthy, and reliable. These are ministers. 80% of the people raised their hands who are professional ministers. They didn't believe it flipped the question and said, well, do any of you believe it to be true? And about 10% did. So the other missing 10% just didn't know. And they're ministers. The reason why people say evil concerning you for his name's sake is because if you really do believe and follow what he teaches. Everyone is going to be skeptical because there are so many hypocrites, so many people who sin and disbelieve in private, but make a public pretense of believing in it. But if you endure that gracefully, if you really do demonstrate faith in Christ, those people who speak evil concerning you will eventually have it touch them and they will realize they finally found an authentic follower of the Lord. And when they realize that, that arouses curiosity. You don't have to bludgeon anyone into believing. You don't have to go ask the golden questions. What do you know about the Mormons? Would you like to know more? 
You don't have to do any of that. They'll ask you. They'll come to you. You may have to put up with a lot of nonsense first. I can't tell you how much garbage there is about me on the internet. I don't defend myself. I don't respond to the nonsense. I just let it go. But I don't know how many people who have come and spent any time with me have walked away shocked at the remarkable difference between this rather welcoming chap who seemed to have a bit of common sense about him versus the lunatic that's out there trying to recruit a cult so that he can fare sumptuously <laughs> while shacking up with a polygamous commune. I do not believe that Joseph Smith originated or practiced polygamy. I believe it is morally wrong. I have taught that. I've been clear on that. I've published things about that. And yet, on the internet, that nonsense still percolates about. So you're going to get lied about. You're going to get misinterpreted. You're going to get misunderstood. That's just what Christ said would happen to you in the Sermon on the Mount. So don't let it surprise you or frustrate you or anger you. Blessed are you. you know, take it in stride. How do, you, how do you think Christ remained so congenial throughout his ministry? If you had the nonsense said to your face that he had said to his face, you would have probably been far less kindly than Jesus was. He walked the path. He set the example. We're just asked to follow it. He's already set the pattern before us, and he's given us counsel in the Sermon on the Mount on how to do it. So, I'm out of time. We're past when we said we would stop. There's still time to hang around in here, and I don't know if we need to straighten things up or um, if there's more treats in the back to be consumed. But I want to wrap up by saying, look, the Book of Mormon is exactly what it purports to be. And Joseph Smith was not only what he said he was, he rather understated the case. Joseph's proclamations about himself were modest. He was more than he said he was, but he didn't think people could hear everything that needed to be said. And although he began the process of the restoration, it was not finished. It's not going to be finished by a group of people atop a multi-billion dollar church that has the financial and political and social clout to decide to undertake a trillion dollar enterprise developing a city in Florida on 133,000 acres. They're not gonna do it. It's gonna be the few who are the humble followers of Christ who take him seriously that will finish up the work. That is currently afoot. That is currently advancing step by step forward to a conclusion. And the promise is that in the generation when it starts, it will all be concluded. There's still time. Generation is a vague timing. We may number them as Z and baby boomers and X and millennials. Lord doesn't do it that way. So however long a generation is, that's how long it will take to wrap things up. I think we've got perhaps decades. Just live your religion. Just set the example. 
arouse the curiosity of others who have seen hypocrisy year in, year out, and live true to your faith. Don't be a hypocrite, and God will use you to a good end. With that I testify in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen.